Hello everyone and welcome to Old Timey Comics, where we'll be going back through the past of superhero comics to check out the good, the bad, and the absolutely ridiculous. All alterations to the panel's text and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. Here we are with the very first episode. Today we'll be going all the way back to November of 1961 to check out the debut of Marvel's first family, the Fantastic Four, as they take on the Mole Man. So let's get started. Starting off with the cover, everyone's showcasing their powers against this giant green monster coming right out of the ground. Unfortunately, they're going about it in a way that doesn't really make any sense. I mean, look at Sue. She's in the middle of turning invisible, but what good is that going to do her when the creature already has a hold of her? And then there's Reed. He comments that these ropes are no problem for Mr. Fantastic, but where'd they come from? They're so small and skinny that I doubt the creature dragged him up to use against him, and it doesn't look like there's any civilians or other villains around, so... Well, that would leave one of his teammates as the one responsible. If I had to guess, I'd put my money on Ben, since he always seems to be trying to find a reason to pick a fight with the other members of the team in all of the early issues. We move into the comic proper now as a flare goes off in the sky. Apparently, it's one of those fancy new flares that can display a completely legible message over the entire city. We see the one who shot it off, and he's drawn in shadow as if they're trying to keep his identity a secret. But if you just look at the body shape and hairstyle, it's clearly Mr. Fantastic, so I don't understand why you would bother. Unless, of course, the cover is just tacked on afterwards and doesn't actually have anything to do with the comic itself. But they would never do that, right? So now it's time to introduce the rest of the gang. Sue Storm, the Invisible Girl, is the first to see the message while over at a friend's place. So what does she do? She doesn't give a, hey, I've gotta go, something just came up. No, she just turns invisible and runs out the door without saying a word. And once she is outside, she proceeds to run into every single other person that's on the sidewalk. Sue, just because they can't see you doesn't mean you can't see them. Come on. So after Sue is done being the most visible, invisible person ever, we skip to a store where a large man in a trench coat is shopping. When he and the clerk see the flare, the man decides he needs to disrobe right then and there, and we're introduced to Ben Grimm, the Thing. So now we cut to Ben's misadventures across town. Even though he had managed to get into the store somehow without destroying anything, he now complains that the door is too narrow and decides to just smash his way through it. Now, of course, this causes a panic, and thus in quick succession, Ben gets shot by the police, smashes his way into the sewers, and then pops back up in the middle of the road right in front of an oncoming car. So that happens. And then, instead of being concerned for the driver, he complains that the guy didn't stop in time when a giant man made of stone popped up right in front of him. Now that Ben's done making a mess of things, the comic moves to Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, as he and his friend work diligently to repair a car. They look up as the hyper-advanced flare from the start of the story now compresses itself into a giant number four, because, you know, flares do that. Johnny needs to get going, so he decides to get there as quickly as possible and rockets into the air, burning a giant hole in the car instead of, I don't know, stepping out of the vehicle first to avoid ruining his buddy's hard work. Jerk. During his quick flight across the city, Johnny's flaming form causes a panic in the people below, so of course it's going to cause problems like Ben's trip did. In fact, his trip escalates even further with the military getting involved. That's right, in what should have been a short flight across the city, the military caught wind of a flying flaming person, organized and scrambled fighter jets, and flew them to New York City. Did the torch get lost or something on the way to the giant flare in the sky? Not that it really matters, since getting close to the planes is enough to just outright melt them. I'm surprised all those pilots aren't parachuting out with third degree burns. Or that their chutes aren't just giant balls of fire. Of course, Johnny's not out of the woods yet, as one of the jets managed to fire off a missile, and it's hot on his tail. Luckily, he's managed to get to his destination, and Mr. Fantastic saves him by catching the missile. With his bare hands. And a human reaction time. Yeah. So a couple technical notes on air-to-air -air missiles. The two main things to consider is that first, the operational range of a missile is typically listed in miles. In other words, realistically, Johnny's been fired on before he even knows he's under attack, 
Or if the pilots fly closer to confirm their relatively small target actually is a threat, they're now too close for missile range anyway. Second, brushing all that aside, you need to consider the speed required of an air-to-air -air missile. After all, they need to be capable of not only catching up to, but overtaking enemy aircraft capable of getting close to or breaking the sound barrier. Even if Reed somehow manages to get his hands on that missile, he's certainly not stopping it due to its momentum alone. Anyway, back to the comic since Reed does somehow catch and dispose of the missile. Johnny's flame runs out in midair and he's saved again by catching on to Reed before he plummets to the ground. This is the first of many times the Human Torch's flame power will run out at inopportune times. Probably close to once an issue now that I think about it. Now that the whole team is gathered and safe from danger- Wait, is the- Is the thing wearing his trench coat again? But how? I mean- When did he- and... Ah, I hate continuity errors. Anyway, Reed prepares to tell the team why everyone spent almost half the issue gathering together. But first, flashback time. We cut to the team preparing to take off on an unsanctioned flight into space with their crew of four. They're desperate to beat the communists into space, but apparently don't have any government support. You'd think, oh, you have a way to get us into space before the Reds? Here, take our money and let's get this launch underway. But nope, they're on their own. So Reed is the scientist and brains behind the flight. Ben is the skilled pilot. Sue is... Tagging along because Reed is her fiance, and Johnny is tagging along because his sister Sue is tagging along. Right. Totally qualified for space travel. The team manages to sneak onto a heavily guarded military base and take off without a hitch. Who needs hours of pre flight checks? Those are for suckers. Once they're into space, though, the rocket is buffeted by cosmic rays and crash lands back on the ground in a hurry. The rays have a strange effect on the team, and we're now treated to a review of the group's powers for the second time in one issue. Sue turns invisible, Ben turns into a pile of rocks and fights Reed and is stretching, and Johnny's ablaze and starts a forest fire. Time to team up and be superheroes. Now we finally get to the actual plot of the issue. Reed shows the team a picture explaining that strange earthquakes have been destroying nuclear plants around the world. We get to see this firsthand as we skip over to West Africa, which was controlled by France around the time, and bear witness as a gigantic sinkhole opens and swallows the installation. Godzilla proceeds to climb out of the newly formed hole in the ground, or at least it's some sort of subterranean monster doing its best impression of him. Unfortunately, before we can get much Godzilla vs. military goodness, the Beast is called off with our first actual appearance of the story's villain, the Mole Man. And we have less than 10 pages to go. By now, Reed has made the brilliant deduction that clearly the threat must be originating from the point that's exactly equidistant from all the attacks so far. And thus the team sets off to Monster Isle. Ooh. Once they arrive, they're immediately attacked by some sort of three-headed hippogriff thing. It decides to go after Sue, who turns invisible, which apparently leaves the beast stunned in bewilderment. This gives Reed the chance to throw his arm around its neck and drag it into the water. Rest in peace, Serbagriff. With the threat taken care of, the ground suddenly gives way underneath Reed and Johnny, separating the party. They wind up in a completely dark cave before an intense, bright light causes them to black out because of... I don't know, sensory overload, I guess. When they awake, they find themselves dressed in these ridiculous blue suits that apparently protect them from the light that caused them to black out. What's it coming from? A natural field of diamonds that are already mined and cut to shape. Their wonder is cut short, though, by the Mole Man, who prepares to tell them his origin story. But first, we check in with Ben and Sue, who becomes visible again just so she can get attacked by a giant rock monster before the team's giant rock monster intervenes and throws the attacker into the drink. Rest in peace, Craggy. With that out of the way, we cut back to the Mole Man moaning about how the surface shunned him because he was ugly and how he eventually wandered into a cave and fell to the center of the earth. Huh. Somebody must have been reading Jules Verne at the time. He tells them how the fall robbed him of his sight, but he somehow developed a radar sense over time. Wait, so what, he's a short, fat daredevil? Man, talk about a horrifying sight if they ever brought that up in modern comics. He decides they can't simply take his word for it and sets out to prove this by engaging Reed in martial combat. 
For some reason, Reed decides to play along and not use his powers, getting taken down like a chump. Having knocked one guy over with a stick, the Mole Man decides this is the best time to monologue about his plan to invade the surface world using his vast array of underground tunnels. Once he's finished with that, Ben and Sue manage to find the others so this comic can have a climactic conclusion. Things continue escalating as the Mole Man calls Godzilla to join the battle. Johnny flames on to combat it, which he totally couldn't do while the Mole Man was giving his backstory, or beating up Reed, or rambling about his evil plot. Reed then snags the Mole Man with his stretching abilities, which he totally couldn't do while the Mole Man was whining about how much his life sucks, or when he was getting beat up by a portly daredevil with a stick. During the commotion, the Mole Man summons a literal army of subterranean monsters to combat the heroes. As they prepare to battle, the team realizes we only have half a page left and decides to GTFO. As they fly away, the Mole Man decides to blow up Monster Isle because he was discovered, I guess. Apparently, being found trumps a vast tunnel network and a giant monster that shrugs off tank fire. But either way, the Fantastic Four have won the day. Kind of. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos. So what did you think of the first episode and initial outing of Marvel's first family? Have a suggestion for a character or a comic to cover on the show? Let me know in the comments. If you want to see for yourself what these stories are all about, you can either purchase them digitally or check them out on Marvel Unlimited. And be sure to come back next week as we go through Amazing Fantasy number 15, the first appearance of the wonderful webhead Spider-Man.